tonight as we look at scripture, the, the, our statement of faith at Redemption Hill, it says this. It says, God's gospel is authoritatively revealed in the scriptures. We believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors. And as the verbally inspired word of God, the Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation, and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. And so tonight, we're going to explore the Bible, explore the idea of what this what Christian scripture is and why it's important to us. Um, so tonight we get to hear from Bill Kynes. Bill is um, the pastor of Cornerstone Evangelical Free Church in Annandale, Virginia, which is Redemption Hills Sending Church. Um, and he also is a council member of the Gospel Coalition. Uh, Bill ha- is a uh, Master of Divinity from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and a PhD from Cambridge University. Um, more than that, though, I'm excited for you to hear from Bill. Some of you already know Bill because he's been, he, he's been around our church from the beginning, and without Bill's involvement, I can say that Redemption Hill would never have gotten off the ground. And, um, and so I'm grateful for him. I'm excited for you to be able to hear from him, and I'm excited tonight to not be under the lights in the hot seat and to sit under his teaching with you. And so would you join me in welcoming Bill Kynes? It is very good to be with you all uh, tonight, and uh, I heard there was a very big crowd last week, and if it's a smaller crowd this week, it's because, you know, you, you're more excited about hearing from Bill Rodell than from Bill Kynes, or Bill did such a bad job last week that nobody wanted to come back, so I don't know which it is, but it is good to be with you, and it's always good to be here at Redemption Hill, and we're just so excited at what God continues to do among you. And uh, we, we pray for this church, and uh, we are, uh, Bill and I uh, are good friends and get together regularly to uh, encourage one another. Let me pray before I continue. Lord, I pray for uh, this time together that you would use it to encourage us with this wonderful truth about the Bible. Help us to grow in our understanding of what you've revealed and how we ought to view it and understand it. And I pray that this uh, lecture time and the discussion that follows will be helpful for everyone here. Lord, may we approach it with great humility and respect as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the year 386, a 32-year-old man sat weeping in a garden, agonizing over the course of his life. He had a brilliant mind, He had taught literature and rhetoric in Carthage, Rome, and Milan. He had been an adherent of one of the most popular religious philosophies of his day. But he felt himself to be a slave to his sexual passions, taking one mistress and then another in an utterly promiscuous life. In Milan, he had started attending a Christian church, and he'd come under the spell of the preaching of the Bishop Ambrose. He became increasingly convicted of his own moral depravity, but he felt powerless to pull himself out of this miry pit. The tumult of my heart took me out into the garden, he later wrote in his confessions, where no one could interfere with the burning struggle within myself with which I was engaged. I was twisting and turning in my chains. Suddenly I heard a voice from a nearby house chanting as if it might be a boy or a girl saying and repeating over and over again, tola lege, tola lege, take up and read, take up and read. I interpreted it solely as a divine command to me to open the book and read the first chapter I might find. So I hurried back to the place where I had put down the book of the apostle. I seized it, opened it, and in silence read the first passage on which my eye lit. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. I neither wished nor needed to read further. At once, with the last words of this sentence, 
It was as if a light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart. All the shadows of doubt were dispelled. So it was that by reading Paul's words from Romans chapter 13, Aurelius Augustinus, now known to the world as St. Augustine, was converted. And there is arguably no man who has so shaped the thinking of the Western world as much as he. Augustine was transformed by the words of the Bible. Go forward another 1,200 years or so and travel north to Germany, where another professor was going through a similar struggle. But this man was no immoral womanizer. This man was a monk, a monk of the highest moral order. He was to say later, I was a good monk. If ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. But at this time, this monk felt nothing but the horrible wrath of God pressing down upon him. He felt nothing he could do was enough to cover his own guilt. Then in the year 1515, he lectured on Paul's letter to the Romans at Wittenberg University, greatly influenced by Augustine's work on that letter. He wrestled particularly with Paul's words in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that spoke of the righteousness of God being revealed in the gospel. I greatly longed to understand Paul's letter to the Romans, he wrote, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the righteousness of God. Because I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is righteous and acts righteously in punishing the unrighteous. Night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning. And whereas before the righteousness of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. And so wrote Martin Luther, again, transformed by the word of God found in the Scriptures. Let me mention another example. John Wesley was as religious as anyone could be during his days as a student in Oxford in the 1730s. He joined what was known as the Holy Club and became its leader, engaging in early morning Bible study, hours of prayer, both public and private, and myriad philanthropic activities, hoping somehow to measure up to God's standards. He even went across the Atlantic as a missionary to Georgia, but he returned disillusioned with his own faith. He wrote in his journal at the time, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Wesley returned to London, where he came under the influence of some simple Moravian believers from Germany. On the 24th of May, 1738, he joined them in one of their meetings. He wrote this, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. The great Wesleyan revivals of 18th century England, which transformed that nation and impact many others besides, can again be traced to the powerful truth of the Bible. Let's move to one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century, uh, the German, Karl Barth. Barth was nurtured on the liberal theology and religious socialism of his day, which preached the gospel of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, in which, in the words of H. Richard Niebuhr, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. But in 1916, at age 30, while pastoring a small church in a rural village in Switzerland, Bart began to feel disillusioned with the direction of those ideas. They seemed to lead to a dead end. He knew he had no gospel to preach. He thought that a new study of Kant or Hegel might be the answer, but then he turned instead to the words of the Bible. I sat under an apple tree and began to apply myself to Romans with all the resources that were available to me at the time. I began to read it as though I had never read it before. I wrote down carefully what I discovered, point by point. I read and read 
and wrote and wrote. And what impact did the message of Romans have on Karl Barth? What did he conclude? That all the so-called Christian ministry that he knew could not continue as it was. Everything had always already been settled without God, he wrote. God was always thought to be good enough to put the crowning touch to what men began of their own accord. The fear of the Lord did not stand objectively at the beginning of our wisdom. We always attempted, as it were, to snatch his ascent in passing. In a lecture on February 6, 1917, entitled The Strange New World of the Bible, he argued that in the Bible we find something quite unexpected. Not history, not morality, not religion, but virtually a new world. Not the right human thoughts about God, but the right divine thoughts about men. So that the Bible takes us out of the old atmosphere of man to the open portals of a new world, the world of God. Bart's commentary on Romans, in the words of one observer, fell like a bombshell on the theologian's playground. And the repercussions of that explosion are still with us. Can I mention still one more, more recent still? A young man sat in a jail cell full of anger and hate. He was a radicalized terrorist with the Mississippi Ku Klux Klan. He'd been shot in a gunfight with federal agents while being arrested for planting a bomb in a mailbox. In his solitary confinement, he opened the Bible and turned to the Gospels. And there he read of a savior whose love melted his hardened heart. Now that man, Tom Terrence, a former director of the C.S. Lewis Institute here in Washington, has become a dear friend and is now one of the most gracious and gentle men I know. Again, transformed by the reading of the Bible. These are just a few stories. There are many others. And not just of great Christian leaders who spawn great spiritual movements, but also of ordinary men and women, boys and girls, whose lives have been impacted in no less profound ways by the words found in this book. Uh, there's power in these words. Now, unquestionably, the Bible ranks as the world's most read book. It sold close to four billion copies not including the hundreds of thousands that have been given away. The Bible is the most translated, published, and studied book in history. It's been translated in over 1,500 different languages. The Bible has had and continues to have a profound impact around the globe. Uh, I recommend a trip to the Bible Museum, not far from here, to explore that fervor, further. But this morning, I want to, excuse me, this evening, I want to set forth what Christians believe about the Bible and a little bit about why they believe it which I trust will help to illuminate some of its unique power to impact human lives. So I begin by asking, just what is the Bible? And first I would say Christians understand the Bible as a human book written by human authors. This one book is in fact a compilation of 66 books written by at least 30 different authors spanning a period of over a thousand years. And these books are of many different literary forms, historical narratives, poetic prophecies, proverbs, parables, laws, letters, and fantastic visions. And as a human book written by human authors, it can be read like any other book. And seeking to understand the Bible, we want to ask, what did the biblical authors intend to communicate by using the words that they chose? What did the writer mean when he wrote these words? In seeking the original intent of the human author, we must take into account the entire range of the historical, cultural, religious, linguistic, and literary factors that help him arrive, help us arrive at their intention. Now, the question, the question is inevitably raised, do we interpret the Bible literally? Well, yes, if that term is rightly understood. Literal interpretation, or census literalis, as it's been called in the Reformation, involves a determination of the meaning of the text as the author intended it, taking into account all the factors just mentioned. In this sense, the literal meaning must be determined literarily, 
and an appreciation of genre and literary form and all the rest of it, are, they're all important in interpretation. In poetic passages, words are often used metaphorically. In writing history, we, we read it as a historical account. Apocalyptic passages are filled with symbols and vivid imagery. And sometimes the, the authors may speak ironically or even sarcastically. And so our interpretation must wrestle with the way words are used in the literary context in which they're found. The meaning of the Bible for today must begin with and be controlled by the meaning intended by those who wrote it. And this is where the objectivity of biblical interpretation must be found. Here we simply affirm that, as with any text, we must respect the intention of the author. The golden rule demands as much. Isn't that how we wish our own writings to be treated? The Bible is a human book, and it should be understand in the, uh, understood in the same ways that we understand any other book. Engaging our minds in seeking to decode the words of the text using all the tools that the science and the art of hermeneutics gives us. But from the beginning, Christians have claimed something much more about the Bible. It is a human book, yes, written by human authors, but it's also a divine book, also expressing the word of God. In that sense, it demands to be read like no other book. The Christian claims that the Bible is the verbally inspired word of God. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, quite simply, that the Bible has its source in God. God himself speaks through the human words of this book. The biblical passage that speaks most clearly to this is found in Paul's second letter to Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture is God-breathed, Paul writes. The Greek word is theopneustos. Now, some of the older translations speak of the Scripture being inspired by God, and that description is commonly used. But Paul's word has a slightly different connotation. The emphasis is not so much on the inspiration of the writers, as we might say that uh, Shakespeare was inspired or Longfellow was inspired. No, the emphasis is not on the inspiration of the writers, but on the divine source of what is actually written. The focus is here is not on the process, but on the divine product. It's as if it came from the mouth of God. He breathed it out. Now, there's nothing here that implies that the Bible was given to us by divine dictation, as is claimed for the Quran or the Book of Mormon. The Bible, most of it anyway, wasn't a result of some men simply taking down by shorthand some audible words of God. The Bible was written by human beings with all their human faculties engaged in the process. Luke, for example, begins his gospel by speaking of his careful investigation of the facts which he intended to set forth in his book. Well, there's nothing about a voice telling him every word to write. But his work is still a God-breathed product. For God, in his providence, had prepared that man for that revelation, producing just the kind of man he desired and preparing him through all the experiences of his life so that he would freely produce just the book that God intended that record of the life of Jesus given by Luke to be. And so when we say that the Bible is an inspired book, we mean that God has worked by his Holy Spirit through the instrumentality and the personality and literary talents of its human authors to produce the very words that God wished to be written to reveal himself and his purposes to human beings. And that's what Christians mean when they say the Bible is inspired. It is a divine product coming to us through human authors. And so in that sense, the Bible has dual authorship, human and divine. Now, uh, Peter describes this process as men speaking from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Now, apart from that description, we have no way of grasping this mysterious concurrence of God's will working through the human will in producing this divine human word. And when we say that the Bible is verbally inspired, we simply mean that the very words themselves are what God intended us to have. And that's what we mean when we say that all Scripture, Scripture in all its parts, including the very words that were originally written, all Scripture is God-breathed. 
Now, you may notice that I use the term Bible and Scripture to refer to the same thing. Now, when Paul the Apostle spoke of all Scripture, he was referring to the Hebrew writings, what we call the Old Testament. Uh, for Paul, the term Scripture referred to those books that were considered sacred and authoritative for the community. They constituted a canon, a rule, by which his teaching was to be judged. And Jesus spoke the same way, categorizing Scripture as the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, in Luke 24, for example, all of which was authoritative for him. Now, there seems to have been little dispute about which books constituted the Scripture in their day, the Old Testament canon of Jesus' day. They commonly held the conviction that God speaking through the prophets had ceased after the time of the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. 24 of the 36 Old Testament books are cited in the New Testament, and many of those uh, passages explicitly call those texts Scripture. But you might ask, what about the 29 books of the New Testament? How can these books now be included in Paul's designation of all Scripture? Well, the first Christians inherited the Hebrew Scriptures. <clears throat> but we need to appreciate that the ministry of Jesus presented something new. Jesus taught and acted as one who had authority, a new kind of authority. He never disputed the authority of the Hebrew Scriptures, but he claimed that his words were on a par with the words of those Scriptures. In fact, that he fulfilled them. The prophets of the Old Testament declared that the Word of God will last forever. Jesus said, my words will not pass away. The Old Testament prophets declared, thus says the Lord. Jesus proclaimed, truly, truly, I say to you. Christians believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection inaugurated a new covenant with God's people. And so it was reasonable for them to expect that this new covenant would come with new authoritative scripture. And so we see already in Paul's first letter to Timothy, the words of Jesus are put on par with the Old Testament scripture. 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul writes, For the scripture says... Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain, quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 25, and the worker deserves his wages. Uh, here, Paul seems to be citing words of Jesus found in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Now, whether Paul was quoting a written gospel or just recalling oral traditions of Jesus' words, we can't determine which, but clearly this demonstrates the authority that was found in Jesus himself for the first Christians. He was the revelation of God. And the book of Hebrews begins with these telling words. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The proclamation of the first Christians was Jesus Christ. In his life, his death, his resurrection, Jesus was the gospel. And by his own design, certain men were designated by Jesus himself as his authoritative spokesman. Those he called his 12 apostles, from the Greek word apostolain, which means to send. He chose them to be with him and then to be sent out in his name. And the criterion for the replacement of Judas as an apostle in Acts chapter 1 emphasizes this point. They had to choose someone who had been a part of Jesus' company from John's baptism to the time of Jesus' ascension. This new apostle was to be an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection. And after the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. But the substance of the apostles' teaching was Jesus. Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, the apostles were witnesses of what God had done in Jesus Christ in these last days. God has spoken by his Son, and so the apostles' role was simply to declare what God had said and done in Jesus and to expound its relevance for the new community of his followers. So God had spoken supremely and uniquely in his Son, and the apostles held a special role in bearing witness authoritatively to that unique revelation. And significantly, in Peter's second letter, he speaks of our dear brother Paul, who wrote with the wisdom God gave him. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, yes, which ignorant and unstable people distort 
as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Here Paul, uh, Peter joins Paul's letters with the other scriptures. And the earliest description of Christian worship does the same, the same thing. Justin Martyr, writing in about A.D. 150, mentions the accepted practice in the gatherings of Christians for worship of reading, alongside the writings of the Old Testament prophets, the memoirs of the apostles, as he called them. Now, uh, writers like Bart Ehrman sometimes give the impression that the selection of which books should compose the New Testament took place after the time of Constantine when Christianity assumed state power. We're supposed to think of some gathering of bishops, as one writer has described it, with their long robes and pointed miters on their heads sitting around a big table piled high with rolls of books. One pile is labeled gospels, the other epistles, and so on. And members of this committee examine each volume with more or less care. Most of them are put aside with gestures of disapproval. And finally, a small selection is made and entrusted to the chairman who draws up a careful list of its contents and subsequently, no doubt, hands it over to a publisher with proper authorization. In due time, the New Testament, collected in one volume, is disseminated throughout the Christian world. The rejected books were labeled apocryphal and then banned and were subsequently burned or otherwise suppressed for all sorts of nefarious reasons, chiefly because of the bishops' desire to maintain their political power and to further their misogynist prejudices. And this imposed order upon the Christian church became known as orthodoxy. That's not how it happened at all. <laughs> the canon of the New Testament, this collection of authoritative books, developed over time as the early church came to recognize the unique authority of those writings which came from the apostles, or those closely associated with the apostles, which conformed in teaching to the established rule of faith, and which were used widely in the churches in the context of worship. Within the first two centuries, a high level of agreement was reached concerning most of the New Testament books. Despite the great cultural and geographical diversity of the scattered congregations from Britain to Mesopotamia. Now, eventually it became necessary to delineate more clearly which books were considered scripture. As the church faced the challenge of the heretical views of the Gnostics, which uh, uh, claimed their own gospels spuriously attributed to various apostles, as the church had to combat rival revelations, such as the prophecies of the Montanists, as they had to counter competing lists of authoritative books, such as that of Marcion, and as the church had to face persecution in which protecting sacred books could result in martyrdom. As you can imagine, it became very important for Christians to know which sacred books they were willing to die for. Already in the second century, the bishop Irenaeus created a list. Another from the same period is known as the so-called Muratorian Canon, and there was a list by Eusebius in his Ecclesiastical History at the beginning of the 4th century. All of these lists differed slightly from one another, but significantly all included the four New Testament Gospels and only those Gospels. 20 of the 27 books were never in doubt. Only Hebrews, James, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, 2nd Peter, and Revelation were ever really questioned at all. The first list of the canonical books of the Bible, naming the 27 books of the present New Testament, came from Bishop Athanasius of Alexander in his 39th Festal Epistle of AD 367, and that list gained near universal acceptance. So there never was a church council at which the bishops got together and picked out which books to include in the New Testament. If anything, the church over time simply recognized officially what already existed sort of like the way the Republicans and Democrats officially recognized their presidential candidates at the summer conventions long after the result is known. Professor Bruce Metzger from Princeton Seminary, who's written extensively on the subject, put it this way, when the pronouncement was made about the canon, it merely ratified what the general sensitivity of the church had already determined. You see, the canon is a list of authoritative books more than it is an authoritative list of books. These documents didn't derive their authority from being selected. Each one was authoritative before anyone gathered them together. The early church merely listened and sensed that these were authoritative accounts. 
For somebody now to say that the canon emerged only after the councils and synods made these pronouncements would be like saying, let's get several academies of musicians to make a pronouncement that the music of Bach and Beethoven is wonderful. I would say thank you for nothing. We knew that before the pronouncement was made. We know it because of the sensitivity to what is good music and what is not. The same is with the canon. Christians affirm that all scripture all 66 books that comprise our Bible, all scripture, is the verbally inspired word of God. But why should we believe that? Could it really be true? I mean, I confess that the Bible contains some pretty strange stuff. Some of it I find hard to believe. Some of it I don't want to believe. Could it be true that by means of this book, some of it over 3,000 years old, God has spoken and continues to speak. And when you think about it, it almost seems absurd. I mean, a supernatural book, it would be nothing less than a miracle. Yes, it would be a miracle. But that's just what Christians claim has happened. In the Bible, God has made himself known verbally. Now, how could we possibly justify such a claim? Well, first I would say, consider the context. And by this I mean, consider whether it's even reasonable to expect that the very notion of a verbal revelation of God is even possible. Now, most people would agree that if God is the creator of all things, then the world that he's created may be a revelation of his power and majesty. Uh, the psalmist declares, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hand. But the question is, has God gone beyond these general pointers? Has God addressed us more directly? Has God spoken? I think it seems reasonable to suspect that he may have. For you see, if God is a personal God, and if we are made in his image as personal beings, and if he desires a relationship with us in such a context the notion that this personal God would speak to us is not unreasonable at all. I mean, isn't communication through words the most important way that relationships are established? It may be possible for God to speak to us, but has he done it? More specifically, is the Bible the means by which he's done it? Well, I think it's important to consider that this is just what the Bible claims for itself. The Bible records the testimony of numerous prophets who claim to have been addressed by God. David says, the spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me. Jeremiah, the prophet, says, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth. And he said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. As I've said, the trademark expression of the prophets of the Old Testament is, thus says the Lord. And this notion that God has spoken through prophets is supported in the New Testament also. Again, in the past, Hebrews 1, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. First, uh, 2 Peter 1, 20, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And most clearly, Paul declares all scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God. But perhaps more impressive in appreciating the understanding of the New Testament writers about the Old Testament scriptures with which they worked is to see the indirect ways they make this connection. There's a long list of passages which assume that what scripture says, God says. Uh, for example, Acts 4, 24 and 25. Sovereign Lord, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, saying, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Now, this is a quotation from Psalm 2, which has words attributed to David, not to God. But here it is the sovereign Lord who says these words. And there are other passages in which the term Scripture says is used when quoting a text in which God himself is the speaker. And this sort of substitution is possible only under the assumption that the text of Scripture can be identified with the utterances of God. What God says, Scripture says. And what the Scripture says, God says. So consider its claims. 
The Bible claims to give us the word of God. What scripture says, God says. But why should we believe such claims? By what authority should we give such claims any credibility? Well, I believe that authority is no less than that of Jesus himself. There is no question that Jesus believed the scriptures of his day to be the very word of God. Jesus taught the authority of the scriptures, Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus rebuked those who put human traditions above what had been revealed in the scripture, which Jesus calls the word of God. And in several places, Jesus equates what is written in the Bible with what God says. An example, in quoting a passage from the book of Genesis, which in its context was a statement of the human author, Jesus referred to it as something God had said. Again, in Jesus' view, what the scripture teaches, God teaches. And Jesus not only taught the authority of Scripture, he also used it in various conflicts with religious teachers. His final court of appeal was the Scriptures. As he would say, have you not read? Have you not read? Citing a passage from the Bible. When he said, it is written, that clinched an argument. There is no appeal above what the Scripture teaches. For the Scripture cannot be broken, Jesus said, John 10. And Jesus chastised his opponents for their neglect and ignorance of the Scriptures. Are you not in error because you do not know the Scripture, Jesus says. And even in his conflict with the devil, Jesus quoted Scripture as his response to temptation. The Scripture was formative for Jesus' life and in his teaching. When he was arrested, he he blocked Peter's desire to fight for his master's life. Do you not think I can call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But all this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And after his resurrection, we read that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, the life of Jesus is inexplicable apart from his devotion to the scriptures and their formative role in his life. Jesus believed that the scriptures were the very word of God, and he appointed his apostles to be his authoritative interpreters in the world. The divine authority of scripture, both Old and New Testaments, they are certified by Christ himself. And so I would say to the question, what do you think of the Bible? Is it the word of God? I would first ask, what do you think of Jesus Christ? Is he the son of God? And the answer to the second question should answer the first. Though that ought to be enough, there's more to be said. And here I move from more objective aspects of this question to more subjective ones. That is, how does the Bible affect me personally? In effect, we move from what the Bible is to what the Bible does. And here I would argue that the divine nature of the Bible is confirmed in my experience as it leads me into truth. In that sense, the Bible can be compared to a map. Now, how do you know that a map you have is a true map? That is, it's a map that rightly represents reality. Well, you could rely on authority. Maybe the map is published by a reputable map maker, National Geographic, or even the National Mapping Agency of the U.S. government, which is the U.S. Geological Survey. That would give you a good reason to believe what the map is telling you. Well, I believe Jesus gives us just such an authority when it comes to the Bible. But another way you come to believe in a map is by actually taking it out into the real world and seeing if it matches what you find there. And something like that happens when you come to the Bible. You find that it conforms to reality. It fits the world. It matches what we observe about human nature. It makes sense of some of the most basic and most mysterious aspects of our own human experience. Now think about it. Why are we human beings at the same time both creatures of immense dignity but also creatures of utter depravity. 
Well, the Bible declares that we are both creatures created in the image of God, but also creatures currently in rebellion against God. Why do we recoil at the prospect of death and consider it an invader, an enemy, and yet nothing is more natural and universal? Well, the Bible teaches that God has created us for eternity, but the death entered the world as a just punishment for our sin. Why do we all have a, a deep sense of moral reality, of right and wrong, of good and evil, while none of us can even live up to our own standards for ourselves? Well, the Bible declares that in turning away from God, we now worship false gods, gods which enslave us and distort our desires. I could go on. See, this is the map of human experience that the Bible gives us. And as I look at what the Bible tells me, I see myself there. And my own perplexity and my own aspirations of a human, as a human being are found in the Bible as nowhere else. In the Bible, I find a map that accurately sets forth who I am as a person. It explains me. And it explains the world in which I live like nothing else. Where else can I go to find such words of truth and life? But the truth of a map is not only found in the way that it represents reality, it's also found in its effectiveness in getting people to where they want to go. And the Bible does that too. The Apostle Paul speaks of this when he writes in his second letter to his co-worker Timothy. He says, From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, the Bible has a power to lead people into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You see, that's its purpose. That's what it's been given to us for. God uses his word in the Bible to make himself known to us. And he does. And that has been the testimony of people through the ages. Why should we believe the Bible? Is it really the word of God? Well, in fact, there's nothing I could say that could actually prove that it is. You see, there's no authority apart from God himself who could stand above God to authenticate his word. No, he must do that himself. But the Bible declares that that's just what he does. First, he does it outside of us through Jesus Christ. Our Lord certifies the divine nature of the scriptures. But then God also authenticates the divine nature of the Bible within us, as the same Holy Spirit who worked within its human writers also works within its human readers. You see, there are times when we hear or we read the words of Scripture, and its truth just leaps out at us. It speaks of God's holiness, and we are moved to repentance. It promises us God's grace, and we're led to faith. It reveals God's glory. And we're inspired to worship. I think of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's what happens when God's Spirit testifies to the truth of God's word in our hearts. We see something of the glory of God in the face of Christ. John Calvin writes that we can know that Scripture is the word of God only by faith. Its certainty is founded upon the inward persuasion of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith declares that however much we may be moved and induced by arguments, evidence, and the testimony of others that Scripture is God's word, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. So I would say, if you really want to know if the Bible is the word of God, you must read it. You must read it with an open mind and an open heart, willing to listen to the divine voice which, with which it speaks. 
You must read it looking for the Christ who is revealed there from Genesis to Revelation, asking God by his spirit to confirm its truth in your heart. For Christians affirm that the scriptures are the verbally inspired word of God. Now I'll stop there. In the next lecture, we'll consider the implications of this claim. Namely, that the Bible is true, that it's complete, and that it's authoritative.